Something on Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Abled and On Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together. Thank you to our sponsors. Welcome to this edition of of Able Done On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled uh, in Vermont and beyond. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today. Um, before we get to our guest from the Council on Aging, I would like to mention, according to the BBC News um, reports and reports from uh, the news lately, uh, there's been a polar vortex, uh, a very bad cold snap that's been happening um, in our country right now. And 21 people, according to news reports, 21 people have passed away due to that. Um, uh, um, speaking of which, uh, the Attorney General's Office uh, of Vermont warns of increased hypothermia risk for vulnerable Vermonters and there's heating assistance available. Um, why don't we um, go to our guests so they can explain more about that. Um, our guests today are from the Council on Aging of Vermont. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Um, I'm Chris Shaw. I'm from the Central Vermont Council on Aging and I provide information and assistance in our very office. Okay. And? Hi, I'm Barb Asin uh, at the Central Vermont Council on Aging. I'm the Director of Family Caregiver Support. Okay. Um, since we spoke about, uh, before we get to the missions and goals of your program, since we spoke about the heating assistance and all the problems that we're having now with uh, the cold snap, um, you know, and vulnerable populations, um, explain what your, op your office can do for that um, particular program or for uh, vulnerable Vermonters? Uh, well, what we can do is connect people with a variety of programs. Uh, there's the, uh, well, LIHEAP, um, Low Income Heating Assistance. Um, there's also Crisis Fuel for people who maybe weren't eligible for that program or got a benefit from that program and have used it. Um, and in, with temperatures like we have this year, your benefit gets used up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, there are also some things like the weatherization program. There are some other sources of funds sometimes for um, for heat or for maybe some extra weatherization, things like that. Mm. Um, well, okay. Uh, what are the missions and goals of the Council on Aging since we're on the topic? Um, well, our mission is to support seniors particularly in living with dignity and with their own uh, choices of the way they wish to live. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, since you said that, you can chime in on this as well. Um, being part of a community is, a, is vitally important, especially for elderly or seniors. How does your program bring all of that into fruition, like help, really helping people being part of a community? Yes. Well, <clears throat> say from the outset that we have many partners that we work with. No one organization, let alone one person, can do this alone. So, for example, we help people um, who are looking to have connection in community find adult day services, mm -hmm. like Project Independence or one of the other adult days in our region. And we cover Washington County, Lamoille County, Orange County, and some outlying towns. So it's pretty big pretty big scope out there. That's, that's one way. We offer some direct activities. When you want, we can talk specifically about how we're reaching out to family caregivers and mm -hmm. people who are living with dementia. Okay. Now, since you mentioned Alzheimer's and dementia, um, people get confused between the two. What is the definition? And, you know, the short of it, what sure. is the definition of Alzheimer's and, and, and definition of dementia and how does that all play into? Okay, it? well, briefly, dementia is talking about brain changes that affect people's judgment and mm -hmm. their thinking and their memory 
quite often too. So it's an umbrella term mm -hmm. under which there are many different specific conditions. Alzheimer's is the most widely diagnosed one mm -hmm. that we find probably 60% of dementias are diagnosed as Alzheimer's. Can Alzheimer's and dementia happen just in seniors or can it? No, and there are, and of course there are other causes too. So Alzheimer's disease and other dementias like vascular dementias that might be caused by a stroke or Parkinson's disease might have a dementia aspect of it. Um, and, you know, diseases can hit people at different times. Most common with, with Alzheimer's, most common in the population 65 years and older and especially over 80. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you mentioned Project, Indepen uh, Project Independence. What exactly is that and, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between, you know, day programs and so on and so forth? Right. So, uh, you know, we have, just to distinguish, there are many senior activity centers in our area, and they are a vital place where people come together for congregate meals, you know, for, for sharing meals, as well as many, many activities, educational activities, and we do outreach with them. Mm -hmm. For people who have needs to be safe and uh, engaged and have community and maybe even have some, um, some medical assistance during the day, such as taking medications or perhaps even bathing, adult day programs can address that level of care. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're actually really important as a kind of a social club. Mm -hmm. So more than a, a place just for safety, it's really to enrich the lives of people who can use that, um, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. And it's true that if it, it benefits caregivers very much too because they know that their loved one is in a place. So it's like a respite of sorts. That's an aspect of it for sure. It's respite for the caregiver, but in, probably most important it's that it's social engagement and, you know, engagement on various uh, levels with live, live music or, you know, and fun conversation and, mm -hmm. you know, people of different abilities and different conditions can go. Okay, well, you mentioned different programs. Uh, what if, um, and here's a scenario, <coughs> what if someone needs further care, such as a nursing home or nursing facility? Mm -hmm. Does your program at Council on Aging help with transitioning from that? Let's, let's talk, Chris, about uh, Again, it, it depends on the exact situation. Um, if people maybe are getting services through long-term care Medicaid, that program is called Choices for Care, so people have a choice of receiving that care mm -hmm. in their own home, in, in a residential care, like an assisted living type facility, or in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. So that may be a continuum for that person. Well, what's the difference between a nursing home and a, 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 and a facility? And a, 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 um, a living facility. A, so. Assisted living residential care type facility um, is for people generally who don't have quite the level of medical need that somebody would have in a nursing home. So a nursing home would be considered a level three? A, a nursing home, basically a hospital is a level one. A nursing home for most people is a level two. Sometimes they get some level one services, but generally it's level two. A residential care home for the most part are level threes, which means they have some nursing oversight. Um, uh, medication help, et cetera. Right. Um, some places have a nurse 24 seven. Some people have a nurse who maybe comes in a couple of times a week. Um, it depends. And the, the level of care that, that a residential care home would be willing to provide varies from one home to another depending on their setup. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to have how long has Council on Aging been around or, or doing programs in, uh, in Vermont itself? Uh, I mean, what is the history of, some, some of the history of uh, Council on Aging? It was, the agencies on aging originally were created by the Older Americans Act in 1964, mm -hmm. same time as uh, Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, originally, it was kind of a diverse um, situation where a number of the, um, like the meal sites might have had, you know, some advocacy services and they would provide transportation to meal sites and um, 
in the 80s, I believe, um, they basically construed the, the language of the Older Americans Act a little differently and looked more closely. Um, which said that the agencies on aging should not be providing those types of direct services. So Why is that? I mean, those services are important. Oh, they are. And what happened is that they, they transferred the, the, um, the way that they provide those services. Um, a big part of our funding now is funds that go out to support senior centers, transportation, um, the nutrition programs, those things. Mm -hmm. um, so we support those programs, but they're run independently. Mm -hmm. So they contract to us to provide those services, mm -hmm. and we oversee some of those services. Maybe you um, could also talk about what options counseling is, how people find out about those yeah, services. Yeah, like if some people might be scared of, uh, okay, um, I'm elder, well, I'm, um, I'm a certain age now and I need, I would like to go to some of these programs if I don't know about them. So yeah, how does the, the counseling part work? Or the intake right. um, More, um, issue? Most often those things come in through our, our helpline, mm -hmm. our statewide 800 number. Which um, we can mention at the end of the program. Which we will. Um, Sometimes we get referrals from doctor's offices or neighbors or any number of other um, entities in the community. Um, and usually at that point, we would reach out to someone and do um, options counseling, which is really just to sit down with somebody and let them know what's available out in the community to look at what their specific goals are, um, at what, they're, what they want, what they're willing to take, what they don't want to hear about. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by what, what if they're willing to take and what do they don't want to hear? Um, what, what, what do you mean? Like, well, I can't tell you how many people have said, I am never ever going to a nursing home. So that's, that's fine and we can talk about, okay, these are, you know, some things that you can do that will make it easier, safer, better for you to be in your home. These are some other options that would be out there for you. Um, yeah, I was looking at a listing. There's lots of listings uh, or several listings in Vermont uh, of nursing home and care facilities and those things. Uh, matter of fact, one of them is run by CVH. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, those are important. Um, for those who need it. Absolutely. But a person, uh, in my opinion, I feel that, I mean, a person shouldn't be forced to go into those, pro if they don't have to, right? Or how does that there, work? There are a lot more options now for people to get care at home. Uh, Long-term care Medicaid can pay for care in the home. Um, there are some other programs, um, depending on people's financial eligibility, that could pay oh, for care in the home. Oh, it has to go according to financial. Eligibility, it right. depends. Some things do. Um, Long-term care Medicaid can pay for a lot of care in the home. Um, there are some other programs. Um, moderate needs pay is for people who need a little help. Maybe it's a couple hours a week. Somebody. What is moderate? To, what is the moderate? Uh, uh, what it, What is the moderate needs program? Um, it's an offshoot of long-term care Medicaid, um, and it's it's intended. It's through Medicaid. The financial uh, piece is more lenient than long-term care Medicaid. Paperwork is much more lenient, um, and it's for people who don't need a whole lot. Maybe they need somebody to go to the grocery store or somebody to make some meals and put them in the fridge so they could microwave them later, or or someone to help clean the apartment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Heavier yeah. things that they and, can't do. I mean, this is you know an area where advocacy is an important dimension too, because there's really quite a bit less funding for stuff like moderate needs than is needed. And if you look at it as a preventive factor for helping people get that level of need so that they, you know, their situation doesn't worsen, uh, it's a really good investment. Worsen? A meaning that you know, if they don't have help with getting their meals together, then their health condition could deteriorate. So it's a good investment to do that more 
upstream right. level of care. You can spend and a little bit of money now which may prevent them needing a nursing home in the future. And, mm -hmm. and that, so that, you know, we, we do want people to know about that service, but in terms of managing expectations about it, we, we often are, are hitting limits um, about the availability. Because and then, and mm -hmm. then, you know, there might be, um, it might become more available. One of the ways that moderate needs is used is to pay for adult day services as well. When we talk about nursing homes also, I'm just going to briefly mention this. Um, I've heard like in different states they've had um, issues with nursing home abuse and certain programs with abuse with patients. And Does Council on Aging advocate for um, like programs that deal with abuse in elderly or how did, mm. does your program help with that? Um, absolutely. Um, one of the, pl the services that we contract to is Vermont Legal Aid, which mm -hmm. has the long-term care ombudsman who yeah. deals, kind of deals with direct issues. If a particular person isn't getting the services that they need or has a complaint about something, they will try to work, um, hopefully in a, in a, negotiable way with the with the nursing home to try to figure those things out. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard in the past, I've heard some har uh, horrible stories on the news about, you know, abuse in nursing homes and that type of thing. Um, we also work with Adult Protective Services, which is a state agency which does investigate um, mm -hmm. issues uh, mm -hmm. with nursing homes. If we make a complaint, we're also mandated reporters, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we see something, uh, say if you see something they have in New York too. If you see something, say something. Exactly, yeah. we're required by law to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now well, we don't do we don't do a lot of direct work within nursing homes, though. You know, we're working with folks who are in the community. Sometimes there is some transition going on where we might get involved. Would you say that's the case? Well, we have, there are a lot of people who are there short term for mm -hmm. rehab. You yeah, know, maybe yeah. had a hip replacement or had pneumonia and are there or something like that so we help people transition back into the community mm -hmm. um, so I mean we we do a, a fair amount of work not with people who are long-term in the nursing home but we go to discharge planning meetings help people figure out you know what do you need to accomplish in the nursing home so that you can safely go home do you need something different when you get home than you've had so that you don't have to come back those one of the of things, things. That, and that we're mentioning on your program today is it's vitally important uh, on this program today to say that that you know what your program does is remarkable because you don't want to take the person's independence away Important. And that's why you have Project Independence, um, because you know a lot of people were scared of getting older, you know. So what are some of the myths and uh, and uh, of um, or the misconceptions around elderly people, or you know, if a person's mm -hmm. special needs and elderly at the same time? What are some of the misconceptions that uh, around that that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. people might be afraid of, or, or so on? Oh, well, one would be that, you know, people are not able to learn new things when actually they, re they really are mm -hmm. and able to, uh, for, you know, even for people with dementias, they're still able to enjoy many important things in life. You know, mm -hmm. some of the information isn't there, but all of the feelings are intact, mm -hmm. you know. So in terms of being able to have joy and have relationships and experience quality of life, mm -hmm. that's still there. Sis? We mentioned quality of life. I noticed you have an event coming up. Um, explain about the yeah, memorable Mem Times Cafe. I'd be glad to. So there is an international movement that's been it, it's going all on over. For, okay. for years called Memory Cafes. And uh, in central Vermont, we actually, for four and a half years, had been running Montpelier Memory Cafe at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center um, on Saturday mornings, and, and that was going very well, four and a half years, good run. Um, and we came to think that we might want to try a different venue and a different time of the week to reach people we hadn't reached before. We got connected with a region-wide, what they call the Memory Cafe Percolator, which is cute when you think about coffee and percolators, um, and to get the benefit of what people in the broader region, this is talking about the Boston region and New England, 
uh, we're finding. And some of the things that were important are what we have brought to a reconfiguration of Memory Cafe that we now call Memorable Times Cafe. Mm -hmm. It's a monthly activity. It's a social activity for people Food, with refreshments. refreshments and uh, activities. Um, uh, for people with early to middle stage memory loss, we wouldn't turn anybody away, but that's who it really works for best. And their care partners. It's not a drop-off thing. It's a way that friends, family members, spouses um, can come and be in a space where they don't have to feel embarrassed or misunderstood because they're having difficulties uh, with memory or with speech or with um, you know doing some things that they used to do but the whole activity is aimed toward bringing out what people still can enjoy this activity, which is held at the Vermont History Center, we meet the third Wednesday of every month from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Yeah, it's just here for more information. For the uh, Memory Cafe, you can... Uh, that's me. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's me at the Council on Aging. But we are, we're doing this in partnership with the ABLE Library of the Vermont Department of Libraries, which formerly was called the Special Services Unit, but they moved from the Pavilion Building in Montpelier to the Vermont History Center, that gorgeous building. It was the Spalding High School originally, has the Robert Burns statue in front, that wonderful building with exhibits that are standing exhibits and changing exhibits. And the ABLE Library, um, and ABLE stands for Audio, Braille, large print and electronic media. Mm. They're great partners because they bring in all these resources that we actually use in the in the Memorable Times Cafe, books that we look at together. We've had some, they have these things called remembrance kits that the library Braille, owns. Braille, from what I understand, I'm, I'm visually impaired myself, Braille, you know, when you print a book, it's huge print, so yeah. So, and they have uh, talking books, and actually, since we've been partnering together since October, it's been wonderful because people who are coming to Memory Cafe because they want that social activity have had access to the staff and the resources, and it's all free. They get signed up. Mm -hmm. They're able to receive the talking book materials at home by mail. You return it by free from mail. And it's just been a, real, a wonderful partnership, and we're reaching a lot of new people. They're really enjoying it. And the best part is, is that with some of the prompts that we bring in, people are telling their own stories. I mean, stories are so rich and so important, and you'll see family members, you know, hearing stories for the first time from even from their spouse, and it's it's just been very gratifying to be part of that. So that's a once a month activity that uh, is a dementia friendly community initiative. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, so explain some of the, let's go into the meat of, of this. Um, okay, so you have various programs. Um, explain some of the other programs that you guys have that are vitally important for people to know about. Uh, well, we, um, we provide support to local transportation. Um, we uh, we have a volunteer program which can do um, kind of odd things that don't come from other places. Um, For example, um, some of it's just socialization. Somebody needs a visit. Sometimes it's a little housework. Mm -hmm. um, a common thing because there there aren't a lot of programs that cover people who have some kind of a short term medical issue. Um, you know, I broke my arm and I can't wash the dishes for the next six weeks, things like that. Um, they're not going to be eligible for other support programs because it's so short term. Um, but they're able to, we can often provide a volunteer who can provide that, that short term support that they need until they're functional again. Mm -hmm. Some of our volunteer programs, too, are a way that older Vermonters can contribute themselves. So it's really important on both sides. We're serving older Vermonters, but also engaging older Vermonters to contribute that way. Um, in fact, the Senior Companion Program, uh, people can uh, work for a stipend, a tax-free stipend, uh, if they are 
age, they themselves are age and income eligible um, up to 20 hours a week and some of those relationships that are formed are great. We have a, a beautiful video on our website that um, features that program. Anybody who might be interested should take a look at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, go ahead. That's um, other yeah, case that's management. Fine. Other case management pieces. I've got okay. a um, our, also, um, our information and assistance department uh, for people, w again, with maybe a single issue, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out uh, something short term, or I mean, we'll get people who say, well, I'm, I'm 95 and I'm doing great, but I just want to know what's out there for when I get old. Um, uh. <laughs> and we'll go meet with people and just talk about, okay, if you're at a point, if you're not doing great, these are some possibilities. Um, or there may be some, some issue going on right now that, that somebody needs help with, and those people would be seen by our information and assistance department. Do you think um, people are scared of services? Oh, absolutely. Um, and why is that? The, their biggest fear is that somebody's going to make them go to a nursing home, take away their independence in some way, make choices for them, make them do something. They're going to make me move out of my house, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I want to be. And that's not at all what we do. I mean, our job is to help people do the things that they identify that are important to them, which for many people is staying in their house. For some people it's, you know, I'm tired of this big house and I don't want to mow the lawn anymore, but where else can I go? Mm -hmm. And we can help people identify those things as well. Yeah. Um, we do case management for people who have long-term needs who are going to need ongoing support. I noticed you um, have a diagram there. We do. So that, um, well, it, you can show the diagram. We can we can put it up. Can we put it? This would be a yes. Yeah, yeah. We could put we, that up. Well, let me just I'm see can if we can show that. How do we? <laughs> well, so what exactly up. is this diagram showing? Okay, those are some numbers and statistics, but for different programs that we provide. So, uh, if you want to go through um, that, if you can, to a point. <coughs> um, nutrition services, um, we funnel a great deal of money, uh, supports the, um, the senior centers, most of which have nutrition programs. Yeah, so how do yeah, the, the Montpelier Senior Center, for example, how does that work within your program? Like, because um, I know they have meals there. Right. They're an independent entity. We provide some money that supports them, um, and we provide some money that supports nutrition through them. Um, the amount that the Barry Senior Center as well, or just the one that one put here? Um, the Barry Senior Center gets some financial support. They're not a meal site. Oh, they're not. They're not. No. Um, and generally, all of the senior centers do some fundraising on their own because the federal funds that we have to pass to them are not as much. Do as you they work really with need. Meals on Wheels as well? Yes, some of our money also goes to um, support Meals on Wheels. Um, we do training for. Um, now, Meals on Wheels is a program where, I guess, uh, when someone either can't cook a meal or doesn't want to cook, they bring food to them? Is that how it works? Yes, they get meals. Um, it varies depending where they are different. Uh, some of the senior centers, for instance, are only open two or three days a week, so they would provide a, a home delivered meal on those days. Um, they can generally get frozen meals for the other days that they could microwave. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of reasons people take Meals on Wheels. Um, it so could it could be a temporary thing. They just got out of the hospital. They're not really up to cooking. It could be a long term thing. It could be a financial thing. Do, do, um, do you guys um, also in the Council on Aging help people with um, independent living skills as well? Like, for, for example, if someone has a stroke and wants to learn how to cook again, or even as simple as dressing. Of so, mm -hmm. sort, do you guys help? We that? don't do that, but we would help them connect with services that would do that. That would often that would be maybe an occupational therapist through yeah. one of the, uh, one of the home health agencies. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes through some other services, other support services. Um, mm -hmm. The one of the biggest things we do is connect people to other services that provide whatever specific support it is that they need. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I'll chime in. Of course, one of the big branches of what we do is family caregiver support because, you know, in, Which this, is important. Go in ahead. this network of what's the community made of, <laughs> you know, caregivers are a big part of holding, holding that net together. Mm -hmm. um, family caregivers, unpaid primary caregivers, whether they actually live in the same home as the care receiver or, or they don't, they might be they might be a spouse, they might be an adult child, they might be another relative, they may be a non-relative, a, a friend who's, um, you know, really helping this person. And uh, so we see the importance of uh, recognizing all that caregivers are doing and how much um, it can feel like they're alone. So where what, what we offer are uh, resources, information, activities to help caregivers first of all, know that they're not alone, um, validate that they need a break from what they're doing, that they need help, they can't do it all on their own. Yeah, um, I noticed that, well, um, when you say can't do it all on your own, it, some people need respite. So okay. explain what that might mean for a, fam a caregiver sure. working with uh, a loved one. Absolutely, thank you. And so, you know, respite is talking about giving, <clears throat> getting a break. And, and by the way, sometimes the care receiver needs a break from the caregiver. It can be mutual, you know, in a healthy <laughs> relationship. You, you laugh, but how, how important is that, having a break? Uh, well, certainly for the caregiver, it's enormous. It's one of the things where people uh, find a great deal of stress is feeling like they don't have any time for their own thoughts, <laughs> you know, and uh, everybody needs to feel, everybody, a care receiver, caregiver, needs to feel like they're a person, they're just not this role of caregiver or care receiver. So doing things that, you know, nurture their, their sense of their own self, their own humanity. We have one program I'll, I'll mention specifically um, that does have state funding called Dementia Respite Grant Program, mm -hmm. and that is recognizing that the caregivers for people with Alzheimer's and related dementias are especially vulnerable to a high level of stress that can have medical implication too. And so uh, we have grants available. Uh, they run with the state budget year. Uh, they are renewable for people who um, qualify for that but don't yet qualify for choices for care, the long-term care Medicaid. And that allows the caregiver to hire substitute care, whether from a licensed agency or, uh, or an individual that they want to hire and for whom we, we assist them for free uh, with getting a background <coughs> me, check you, you mentioned, I apologize, you mentioned okay. choices for care. What exactly is that? That was, uh, Chris was referring to it earlier. That's oh. the state's long-term oh, yeah. care Medicaid program, right? Yes, mm -hmm. So this is for people who are still in the home, uh, you know, in our service area. Uh, the, the caregiver, again, can hire substitute care. They can also use grant funds to do things that take some of the stress off of the, the overall load. So hiring some housekeeping or some, some help sometimes with the outside work, doing some simple home modification like putting in grab bars so that they're not constantly worried about what's going to happen when their care receiver is having trouble, you know, transferring from one place to another. Um, and, you know, always available to give more information about that to folks who call us. Um, <coughs> since we only have a couple minutes, well, I mean, we have some time left, but um, phone numbers, addresses, the importance of getting in touch with um, Council on Aging? Well, the helpline, which is often the, is usually the best way to access us, is 1-800-642-5119. Um, that number is plastered all over everything. Um, and the way that number <coughs> works is that it connects you to the agency that serves the area you are calling from. There are For five, example? There are five agencies on aging, and theoretically, when you call that 800 number, it will connect you to the one that serves where you're standing at the time. In the age of cell phones, sometimes <coughs> that does not work as well. Um, what do you mean? Um, well, I live in central Vermont, and if I dial that number, I get connected to the agency in Chittenden County. 
Oh, okay. But you um, can just ask for Central Vermont yes. and so <laughs> we'll, we'll get so you there. We'll, so we'll get you where you need to go. So it doesn't act, that that number doesn't act like 211? Or is it similar? It to is like, yeah, it is It is really a 211 for seniors and um, Can you repeat that number people. again one more time? 1-800-642-5119. And um, before we end the program, um, the future goals of the importance, of, well, this was extremely important today, but what are the future, some future goals of um, Council on Aging? Yeah. I'll, I'll mention one of the kinds of outreach that we want to do to support family caregivers who will yes, then help their loved ones stay at home yes, is to do some education uh, at work sites. Mm -hmm. There are so many caregivers who are still doing their best to hold down a job in the community, have challenges with that. They may or may not actually be known uh, to their employers being caregivers. There may have been some sense that that's a risky thing to disclose. So to give uh, employers education and to provide education and resources on site at work sites to reach those folks who are burning the candle at both ends. Well, okay, well you say burning the candle at both ends. What exactly is that? Mean and entail. It might be working in the community uh, at a at a workplace during the day and coming home or stopping at the home of your parent or something to make sure that their needs are met so that you're working kind of around the clock and um, you know that there are many things that employers can do to help bring information and resources and support to maintain to retain really good employees and to see that this is only going to grow. This segment of the population that's providing care mm -hmm. as, our, as our demographic ages and grows, it's just going to be a, a more and more present issue for people to be managing the care of loved ones as they are trying to live their lives as well. Okay. Um, can you mention again the yes. Memorable Times Cafe? Certainly. Memorable Times Cafe is the third Wednesday of each month from 1.30 to 3 p.m. at the Vermont History Center. Mm -hmm. We also have um, a course coming up in uh, the spring and we'll offer it in, in Barrie, which is Powerful Tools for Caregivers. That's two hours uh, um, an afternoon six times, so once a week for uh, one afternoon for two hours. And that is a way that caregivers can meet with other caregivers. It's an evidence-based course. People, we talk about dealing with stress, communication. It's not easy dealing with stress. Not at all. Communication, dealing with family members. It's a mixed bag oftentimes, making hard decisions. Taking care of the, the focus is on taking care of the caregiver so that they can be of use. <laughs> Could you get, uh, is there, um, I know there's a number down here for Council on Aging. Could you give that number, please? So for the Family Caregiver Support Programs like Memorable Times Cafe, the Dementia Respite Grant, Powerful Tools for Caregivers, and Caregiver Tea, which we actually have every other month on a Friday afternoon, um, the Family Caregiver Support Program is 476-2681. Can you repeat that again? Yes. 476-2681 in the 802 area code. Okay. Um, and uh, is, there, is there an email that they can reach you guys? Uh, CVCOA at CVCOA.org. Okay. For more, for more information on um, Council on Aging and its programs, you can reach 802-476-2681 uh, uh, or um, at CVCOA.org. Or www.cvcoa.org. Um, <clears throat> again, I would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Abled and on Air. Um, for more information on um, Abled and on Air, you can reach me at my email address at, um, at abledtv980 at gmail.com. Again, we would like to thank our sponsors. Um, Arlene is not here today. Um, but uh, tune in for another exciting episode of Able Did On Air. Um, see you next time. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Able Did On Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, 
empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Able to Learn Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together.